Hello, it's Scott Manley here with episode 77 of Interstellar Quest. We have been kind of busy for the last couple of weeks, uh, not just playing uh, Kerbal Space Program, the new version. It's, we have had a lot of things going on, but uh, we have uh, some updates for you. As it happens, there's been a lot of building going on in this antimatter farm since we are within a hair's breadth of unlocking the technology that will let us harness pure antimatter for profit and power. So yeah, we've just been launching these things off of the back of the Marco Ramius, uh, the Ramius Mark III, loading them up onto the onto the uh, antimatter farm. And uh, it turns out that after a, I don't know how long this has been up here, but it's been up here long enough now that it's got almost a half gram of half antimatter. And of course, if you mix half a gram of antimatter with half a gram of regular matter, that's one gram worth of matter converted to energy. Elsewhere, we have the, the Outland is continuing with, uh, of course, Rusty Kerman at the controls. It's been continuing to explore the lunar surface. I'm sure after my recent point two or four videos, you can appreciate just how much science there is to get from the various locations on the surface. So yeah, we have a crew report which says, one small step for a man, one giant bill for mankind. And of course, when they say a giant bill, they do not mean a giant Kerbal sitting between Jeb and Bob. There's an odd signature coming from the crater to the west. You report it to Mission Control, hoping they'll be proud of you. And of course, Rusty Kerman doing his flag duties for the first time in this new location. This is the East Crater, and it has a marvellous view of Kerbin and the sun right now. So let's document that for future visitors, so that they too can appreciate the views that, were, that greeted the first visitors to this location. So Rusty, tell me what you see out there. What are you experiencing? Did I leave the keys in the ignition? I should hope not. Uh, the sample contains a mixture of breccia and melted materials. Okay, moving on, we have the Duna Express, which unfortunately, after failing to burn up in the atmosphere or collide with Duna, is uh, going to collide or is going to have a close encounter with Ike, which is going to kick itself up into this high inclination orbit, which unfortunately has its peridune high above Duna's atmosphere. Therefore, it's not going to have that nice, slow, deliberate decay until it impacts. No, no, this thing is going to orbit, get kicked up, and then will be entirely at the mercy of Ike here. Now, we're skimming through the atmosphere at four times regular speed, and you can actually see the orbit changing relatively significantly there. I guess the periaps isn't changing that much anymore because I've skipped through, but... You know, you have to understand that uh, this is a very sensitive moment in the, the orbit. These close encounters will change the orbit significantly, and moving the orbit by just a little will have a significantly larger output change compared to the input change. It's called sensitive dependence to initial conditions. It is the essence of chaos. And you will find that uh, any orbit which has a close encounter with an object, it will spread the debris all over the place, spread the various possibilities all over the place. And uh, you can actually get a better estimate of what order orbit the object was in beforehand. Moving on, we have the Drez lander, which is finally arriving here, years after the Falcon flew past it, returned to Kerbin, had its science removed and then sent uh, it into Moho. No, this thing that took the slow route because it wanted to land is finally here. Now we're looking for the target wherever it is. Time accelerating through, just wait. Wait for the nav ball to change. We're obviously coming in towards the sun, I think, here. Bingo! That looks like a change that... Oh, I did not know... Look at that giant galaxy there. My, that is quite impressive. Okay, so we're traveling at 2.3 kilometers per second, and it's pretty much a case of lighting up the engine and slowing ourselves down into a capture orbit. We're actually at quite a high altitude right now, which means that... Uh, we're going to reduce our velocity to practically zero and then come in on a highly eccentric orbit. 
but uh, that will mean that we pretty much have to kill our entire 2.3 kilometers per second. I could saved a little if I'd adjusted my orbit to pass closer to Dres, but I have a specific plan which requires me to be in a highly eccentric orbit, so honestly, I wasn't that bothered. Look at this, orbit velocity is now... Yeah, at 30 meters per second, we're now in a bound orbit. But I want to bring the periaps down to just about 10 kilometers above the surface here. You see, because even though Dres is very similar to the moon in terms of mass, because it's so far away from the sun, uh, or because it's not sitting next to Kerbin, its sphere of influence is way bigger, which means the orbital velocity at the outer edges of it is are, uh, absolutely tiny. Anyway, now we're on a collision course with Dres, it's back to old me to explain this cunning plan. Okay, so... I'm gonna. My periapse is deep inside the planet. Time to jettison this uh, fuel tank, which will now be called Impact Probe One. Impact Probe One has been kicked away at six meters per second. Uh oh. Oh great. So Impact Probe One is now orbiting Probe One, which means it will never land on the surface. Um, that's embarrassing. That's the second impactor I've lost. What shall I do? Um, maybe. Maybe I can chase it down and kind of like bump it back in. Hold on. Um, okay, this is not... Let's let, turn it around. No, that's the wrong way. It's moving away from me at about six meters per second. So I just need to knock a few meters per second off of this. Um, this is where it would actually be useful to have that antenna deployed. But apparently I can't be bothered fixing it again this time. Okay. Time warp, so I'll move towards the target. I actually have an age. It's going to be like time to periapse is two weeks. We're moving at one meter per second now relative to the target and probably not much faster relative to Dres. Okay. Okay. Just let make some adjustments here. So we need to actually fly around and then turn around and knock it the other way. Which means I kind of need to know my reference velocity relative to Dres. Okay. I could of course just time warp through it. That would be totally cheating. You could, you know, aim for it, thrust and then time warp through it and then turn around. That would be... That really would be cheating. That would be bad karma were I to do that. Okay, now we're getting a little closer, 26, 25, and drop out of time warp. Okay, now, oh, I wonder if I can bat this like a baseball. Bang. Come on, bump. Did I do that? I'm not sure I hit it there. I don't think I did because it didn't rotate. Okay, come on, point that way and fire the engines. Quickly, quickly. Oh, totally missed it. Oh, no, we did hit it. We did hit it. It has bounced off. The question is, is the velocity, is it now an impactor? Yes, look at that. It is going to hit the planet. We can now proudly call this Dres Impact Probe number one. It can now hold its head up high for at least the next 12 days before it slams into the surface and becomes yet another casualty of the Kerbal Science Program. Now, uh, what I'm going to do... I'm going to make sure when I jettison this next one that I am definitely, <laughs> it's definitely going to hit. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to try and point it so that when it jettisons off, its uh, its velocity is sufficient, or the, the velocity basically will enhance the chances of it impacting. So heading towards the planet. Because that's the other thing, once I've dumped these, I'm going to have to accelerate towards the planet. I mean, look at this, I'm only doing it at like 10 meters per second, but now the time to periapse has dropped by five whole days. So we'll get there, well, we'll get there three days ahead of it. And now, look at that, jettisoning it straight towards the planet. Aha, that one's going to do well as well. Brilliant, that's me got two impactor probes. No. It's just a case of making sure that I get there and land before these things. So I'm going to actually have to accelerate back towards Dres. And because I'm so high up, that will mean that I actually end up in a hyperbolic orbit. It's going to look like an, an escape trajectory. There is... you see it there? I'm going to fly past it. 
Don't hit it. We're not per- wanting to perform impact physics on the spacecraft. We're going to land it and collect the data. And we might even return home with some of this data. Okay, that's looking pretty good. Now let's just adjust my orbit. I'm going to go... There we go. 24. 24 kilometers is pretty good. And I'm going to get there in six days, which means I should get there a couple of days before any of my hastily created impactor probes. That bodes well for this mission, assuming I can land it. Okay, and we're just going to set a five-minute margin to make sure that I have plenty of time to decide my landing site. Meanwhile, I have also been launching spacecraft to build out my new interplanetary, I don't know, monster spacecraft. Honestly, uh, this is a this is a cool thing. This is going to be my uh, this is my brain. So it's a mainframe, a supercomputer. I'm not sure whether it's going to be worth spending the science to upgrade this to an AI. I'm going to figure out what kind of returns I'm going to get on it because I still have about 10,000 science that I need to get to unlock warp drive. And then, of course, there's science to be spent upgrading the warp drive to, you know, the the enhanced, whatever, the a complex fuel geometry. Anyway, this is an important part of my DT interplanetary spacecraft. You see that engine there and that reactor, they generate a lot of radiation. So I thought part of this design would have a special radiation shield. And that's what a large part of this package is. I'm just going to drop it on the front there. And of course, docking goes very simply. We just need to keep the thing aligned correctly and keep it rotated correctly. The rotation is very important for a lot of these parts. Anyway, I'll let old me explain the rest. And... Docked! Docked! That's the, that's the second part of this spacecraft. Okay, so what this is, is if I start unfolding things... Look at this! It's like a flower opening in space, but it's actually a flower, a safety-minded flower. So it folds out like that, and then these panels fold the other way. This is completely cosmetic, honestly. I mean, I've added the supercomputer thing. That's not cosmetic. That might actually get some use. But this is just like a cool radiation shield concept. Uh, I mean, there are gaps in it, but uh, having some shielding is better than no shielding, in my, in my opinion. Perhaps some people would prefer 100% shielding, but honestly, I couldn't easily make the... <laughs> Infernal Robotics does not make building this kind of thing easy by any means. Meanwhile, back on the moon, well, we've got more exploring to do. So Rusty takes off and he starts heading north because he is told there's an important, uh, well, there's important new data to be collected northwards of the current location. So, of course, we go into our standard suborbital trajectory, aiming for the place where we're told stuff is. And then, well, as we're flying over, Something is spied. What is that? Wait a second. That looks like an arch. I don't think I've visited an arch during Interstellar Quest. Seems like an appropriate diversion to be made. So yeah, turning around and it was rather aggressive, to be honest, the way this whole thing turned around. But um, yeah, we needed to stop before we flew too far. Now, of course, I did this without actually thinking about what the landing site would be like. I mean, hey, you know, surely the landing site must be relatively solid. I mean, certainly it's not going to be weak. After all, it can support the weight of those giant moonar arches. Uh, so, yeah, we uh, let the velocity, let the gravity do its work, and I start falling towards the surface. And at this point, pay particular attention to my aluminium and oxidizer supplies. Uh, they are getting very, very low. In fact, I don't really notice until a few moments before landing. So this is, of course, all being run at four times regular speed for your benefit. I uh, want to get close to the target, so you see I'm being very careful here, translating sideways to get as close as possible, until old me suddenly realizes that the fuel gauge is getting low. Okay, 16 fuel! <laughs> So, oh, 16 aluminium. This is 15. Okay. And I'm going to have to land on a slope. That is... that is quite a small margin. That is a very small margin. 15... 14... 13... 12... 11... 10... Come on. 
Nine. Don't crash. Whatever you do, don't crash. Seven. Oh, just letting it fall at quite high speed. Normally, I would do, be doing this super carefully, but I'm on a slope as well. Oh, three. Come on. Don't land too hard. Oh, there. I see the shadow. I see the shadow. One. One. And... And we're down 1.1. Oh, no, don't fall. Don't fall. 1.1 units of aluminium left. Whew, that is quite a small margin. Okay. Well, it is time to now scale the lost arch. Rusty, of course, does not have climbing skills, but he has mad jetpack skills. So he'll be able to skip over the top of this using his uh, rocket pack here. This is actually pretty darn high compared to my tiny spacecraft down there. Looks like it's wide enough to support the spacecraft, but I'm not going to try landing on it just yet. There we go. In fact, I'm not going to try landing on it at all because that would be probably the end of this mission. Okay, getting close and slow down. It is strangely angular in design. Almost like it has been hewn from flat you know, polyhedra, flat, flat surfaces. Hmm, what could make it this shape? Why does it seem to lack the detail of the other objects in the landscape? Is that part of its nature? Hmm, who knows? Yes, yeah, so we're about 300 meters away from this. That means this must be off the order of 100 meters tall. That is quite impressive. Although less impressive when you realize that it's such low gravity. You take a small rock and your nine iron, place the rock on a T and knock it into low orbit. Okay, um, T is spelt T-E-E, -E, right? No. <laughs> At least when we're talking about a golf tee. I don't like golf, but that's one of the few things I actually know. Okay, so we've planted a flag here. Oh yes, this is the arch. And we are the raiders of the Lost Arch. Hopefully this arch won't melt our heads or cause them to implode or explode because none of that stuff is covered in the in the flight manual. Yeah, pretty nice view from up here. Let's uh, try flying back now. Just take a, a look at the rest of the thing. Actually, let's try flying down the side here and underneath it. Like, let's thread the needle as they say. Well, lots of interesting stuff to look at, even down here. Be interesting. Oh, you know what? I wonder, does Kerbal Attachment System work on this? Can I can I build a swing from one of these Moonar arches? I honestly don't know. That seems like a worthy project that I will have to follow up with at some point. Anyway, after a week of falling, the Drez lander is now moving at over 450 meters per second, which is actually quite significant. Now, of course, that's uh, near to its escape velocity, so I guess this thing is... It must be smaller than the moon. I, I don't know, but I'm presuming that its actual gravity is slightly lower than the moon as well. Anyway, we just need to pick a site. I've, I'm dropping that periaps down to 10 kilometers, of course, I can collect some magnetic field data and stuff like that. But we've already maxed everything out, essentially, here. Uh, there, is, there is some... Uh, there is about 25% science left in some of these biomes because, you know, you can only carry uh, one of each experiment. And in some experiments, it takes two goes to get 100% of the science. So there we go. I'm going to try and drop myself into this little valley here before I hit those mountains get as close to the center of Drez as I can to maximize the amount of science I can pull from its core. Now at this point I realize, oh, I might be going a little fast and will actually crash into that mountain. So 100% throttle is applied and I start to lift my nose up to try and kill my vertical velocity, but as it turns out, I have pretty much judged this well and I managed to at least stop before falling down. <laughs> but, uh, um, well, it turns out that I didn't pick a great landing site. And now see the shadow. The shadow is a great indicator that we are on course and close to the surface. You know what though? It looks to me, and I may just be imagining things, it looks to me like we might be on a bit of a slope, but I hope it's not too bad. Okay, come on. Oh, wait a second. Did we bump into it? No, we're not. Okay, 
Come on. Oh yeah, we're definitely on a slope here. Don't fall over! Don't fall over. Okay, stop. Yeah, the torque from that wheel is able to hold us upright. So we can actually start performing. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't fall over. So we can actually perform science here. We have a little bit of surface science to do. Uh, new contributions to uh, the science program back home. But anyway, we'll follow up with this in the next episode. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.